So please do stick around. That's going to be immediately after the film. I know it's going to be a little bit late, but please do stick around um, because it's really fabulous for us to have uh, Katarina here for the UK premiere of this film. Uh, so now over to Katarina to introduce the film. Thank you. Um, I won't say that much now. I'll probably say a lot after, or you will have a lot of questions. I will just um, um, tell you that this uh, wasn't a film that I wanted to make. It was a film that I had to make, or it ended up being a film I had to make. Um, and it has uh, created uh, quite a blast in Denmark and in several other countries. Um, and I'm sure you understand why when you have uh, seen it. So um, I can't promise that you will like it, but I can promise that you will never forget it. Um, so <laughs> yeah, enjoy it. By coincidence, I was commissioned to do a, a TV series for Danish television about parenting. Um, and I was uh, advertising for adoptive parents. Um, and then I came in contact with Hannah Lille. And uh, when uh, we started talking, and when she told me that her children-to-be was uh, still living with their biological parents, and she showed me a picture of the mother with Masho, um, I just, um, it, it kind of, yeah, it did something to my picture of where adopted, I thought adopted children was. was uh, babies in a box on a street. Mm -hmm. So I just went down there to, to. Uh, I had to document that, uh, but I still thought that it would be a, a with a happy ending. I thought because I was told by the adoption agency that they were dying, mm -hmm. and um, uh, so I came down there and then I found uh, two people who they didn't look dying mm -hmm. to me, and they had three other children which. The adoption agency, they didn't know in Denmark or they hadn't told me. Mm -hmm. They said it was the only two children and then, yeah. So he said at the beginning, um, and he said a couple of times, that it's not the film you expected to make. You no. thought it was going to be a, a more hopeful film. I thought it would be a, a film about I just lost my own mother, so it was more like I wanted to go into how do you as a mother say goodbye to your child when you know you're dying and then the child would have have a hope for a better future, you know? So I thought that kind of that hope for the child would carry this film through, mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah. And at what point did you, was there, a, was there a particular point of revelation for you as a filmmaker where you thought, actually, I'm watching something completely different happening here? Yeah, when Singer and Hussein left the children at that orphanage, mm -hmm. I was, I mean, uh, I think both me and the photographer, we were crying so much that we could hardly see through our eyes. But it was very hard to navigate in because it had very bad translation. And they, I mean, they went into this willingly, uh, Singhanes and Hussein, and, and the, but I mean, it was very hard to stop <coughs> from shouting, stop, 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 uh, there's something completely wrong here. But I didn't, at that time, I didn't have the imagination to experience what was actually being said at the moment. Uh, I didn't have any translation on the spot. So just let's talk us through the, the, the <laughs> film process then. So um, so you said obviously you had some kind of, you had generic translation yeah. really, rather than specific, and that I, came later. Yeah, I had, uh, from the beginning on I presented this, it, it, I had to move quickly because the children was about to leave. So I contacted the Danish Film Institute and the Danish broadcaster. And the Danish broadcaster said, okay, go ahead, I'll pay for your trip, and then let's see what you bring back. And I brought back this material and said, can you see this uh, tragic? Uh, and he was like, no, but I would like to, you can do it, but I want the Danish angle. I don't want the African to take up too much of our prime time, because then people won't watch it. And I said, yeah, yeah, let's <laughs> we argue about that later. Just give me the money and I'll continue. And then... <laughs> And then we had a lot of argument, and I did a, uh, a, a standalone documentary about the Danish couple going down, where you also saw Singer and Hussein, but I couldn't really question, and I wasn't sure what was going on at that moment. Um, so I, I made this documentary, uh, and it was broadcast on TV2, and it was really touching, and everybody thought it was really good. And I had a, a good viewers, and then I kept on. Then I applied for the Danish Film Institute. I said, "Listen, there's something in this material I need to dive into." And they said, "No, you already told the story, and we can't see that there's anything there." So 
I went on, uh, and then I, and I kept on filming, uh, and I went back to Ethiopia and filmed some more, and I tried several times, both the broadcasters and the Danish Film Institute, but then when things started to, I thought I had a movie already then, but then when things started to go wrong in that part, mm -hmm. then the Danish television, they got interested again. Mm -hmm. And then I could apply, and finally I got the Danish Film Institute, uh, on board, mm -hmm. and then when they were first on board, then it got and it got, yeah, then I could uh, finish mm -hmm. the process. And so, um, you described just then the um, yourself and the um, and you, and your colleague kind of in tears at moments. Uh, how did you juggle that desire, presumed desire, to uh, to intervene versus the desire to keep filming? How do you square that judgment with yourself? Of therapy. <laughs> no, <laughs> no um, it, it's been, I mean, it's been the most challenging, challenging thing I've ever done. I mean, it's, it's been five years of constantly questioning yourself mm -hmm. what, what's the right thing to do now. Um, and I think everybody knows as a, a documentary maker, uh, as a starting point, you shouldn't interfere. Mm -hmm. And but I mean, it's the it, really yeah, really exactly. Yeah. And it's the it's the uh, uh, um, I mean, it's a very old dilemma uh, of the war photographer: should you intervene or should you document what is going on? And um, if I thought that I could have saved Masio mm -hmm. at one point by intervening, I would have done. But I don't know what people think I should have done. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of this story is so complex, mm -hmm. and there's been this is just one and a half hour. Mm -hmm. This process has been going on for five years, mm -hmm. and to include all that complexity in that movie is, I mean, it, there's a lot of people who said you should do uh, you should do a movie about the process of doing this movie. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's been a lot of fight with the adopted parents and with um, psychologists and lawyers and all kinds of things around this. But um, yes, I could have put down my camera and I could have grabbed Matthew and uh, rushed to the car and driven away with her. Mm -hmm. But I can promise you it would only have lasted 24 hours before the police would have found us and that I mm -hmm. would have been able to do this film. I mean. And also I could have questioned the, the, the <coughs> adoptive parents in their uh, educational methods. Mm -hmm. I did that. We had very huge argument about that. Um, the, the whole, uh, I could have told the, the social welfare, but they already knew, everybody knew. I mean, they were there. Uh, you can see who they sent if things mm -hmm. go really wrong. Mm -hmm. That's I mean, the guy you would be complaining to. Exactly. He's the one handling. There was at one point I showed my material to a psychologist, which is the known as one of the mo she's kind of the leading specialist in, in uh, post uh, adoption traumas. Mm -hmm. I showed the, my material to her because I needed a second opinion, and she did. Um, she filed a complaint to the social worker saying there's something completely wrong with this family. Mm -hmm. Nothing happened. Mm -hmm. So I don't think what people think would have, if I mm -hmm. say I've been filming this family, I think there's something really <laughs> wrong. So, so yes, and of course it was hard as a human to watch that, but, but if I had acted, I wouldn't have been able to, sh I mean, the people have could have complained to a kind of the problem mm -hmm. that I'm trying to, mm -hmm. to show. So there was actually, yeah. And, um, have they seen the film? Have have the um, have has Henrietta and Gert seen the film? Yes, it's, yes. I, uh, I would never do it without their the, uh, showing them first. Yes, they saw the film uh, uh, a couple of weeks before the premiere, and they had no uh, problems mm -hmm. uh, with the film. They thought it was hard to watch uh, uh, to see how sick Masi was. That was what they saw. When they saw the film, and she called me the day after and said, "Why did you put in, why did you put in the scene at the dinner table?" Uh, and I said, "I did that to show that this is a dysfunctional family, because I didn't have any scenes. I've been filming for years, and I kept on filming, long time after the the this film just seen uh, ended. 
to kind of get some scene that <coughs> would maybe uh, that could make some kind of understanding for the adoptive parents, mm -hmm. some kind of, uh, or maybe they would have some kind of uh, knowledge or, or a moment of of mm -hmm. self uh, knowledge or, or something, but. Uh, I didn't get it, but she asked me why did you put it in. I said because I wanted to oh, to show that that uh, your family was really dysfunctional and how desperate you were. Mm -hmm. And she said, okay, yeah, I can see that. And she asked me why did you put in that I'm saying that I draw a blank. Um, and I'm saying again to show how frustrated you are. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> and and she said, okay, yeah, I understand that. Mm -hmm. And and. Um, and so, what was the? And I showed it to singer as I'm saying. Right. Okay. And before and the premiere, yeah. And what was their response? That was actually not happy, but it, the worst thing was when I told I told them before that Marcy was okay. was put into an institution. Mm -hmm. That was the worst. That was when they really reacted very strongly mm -hmm. uh, and with huge regret and blame towards themselves mm -hmm. and um, and you know that they don't have that kind of institution in Ethiopia so actually it was kind of a relief for them to see that because they kept asking me but you're hiding <laughs> something is he really sick or so and I didn't you. experience Masha as sick at all mm -hmm. but it was so actually, they were like, ah, okay, uh, you know, to see her, uh, and there was also some joy just to see pictures and mm -hmm. see movies, uh, to see the children that they were alive and they were mm -hmm. were doing good. So, mm -hmm. so it wasn't so hard mm -hmm. for them. Obviously, a lot of the um, attention in the film and in the family is on Masho, but what 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 about her brother? How's he? But I, I haven't had contact with the family for the last year. Mm -hmm. uh, he's still living in the family. Mm -hmm. He's coping quite well with mm -hmm. the adoption. I'm sure he will have some issues when he grows up, but on the outside or whatever, so apparently he's, he's, doing, he's very well behaved. Mm -hmm. what's, the, um, what's the one thing you want people to take away from the film? I think uh, what a, I want I never thought, I never thought about, personally, that I never questioned that adoption was the last solution. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked when I found out the numbers mm -hmm. that orphanages are not orphaning. 95, approximately, percent have living parents. Mm -hmm. So that kind of turned the whole thing around in my head. That I want to know that there's a, a living mother and father in the other end, and it's not because it's it's out of their need, but shouldn't you maybe try to help them out of their need instead of taking the children? It's like walking past a, you pass a beggar on the street, a, a woman with a child, and she says, I'm starving, I'm dying, I can provide for my child, would you please help me? And you say, yes, oh, that's a cute child, I take your child, bye bye. Mm. I mean, <laughs> is that the right thing to do? That's what suddenly, uh, even though you you arrive at some good and caring uh, <laughs> adoptive parents, mm -hmm. that that's one thing. And the other thing is, with children, <coughs> when there's uh, so or that, even at Europa's age, I mean, is it right to? Who owns the right to your story? Mm -hmm. I mean, don't don't you have? your right to your own mm -hmm. uh, story. I mean, it's not like, in Denmark anyway, I don't know how it is in the UK, but in Denmark, it's been like this, you knew just in, in, in when you were, if you were at a dinner um, party, if somebody was adopting, mm -hmm. you weren't <laughs> allowed to question if it right. was like getting your own child. It was <laughs> exactly the same and you, I don't know how many times I nodded. Mm -hmm. I have to, it's mm -hmm. exactly the same as giving birth, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah if, you know, it's like, it's compared to having your own child, mm -hmm. and it's not, you're getting somebody else's child, but mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that you can love and mm -hmm. take care of it, but it's somebody else's mm -hmm. child. An acknowledgement that there's a story. Exactly, that, that there's a story behind yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. 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 
Okay, and um, I think that's a good point. Um, Aaron, I'm going to ask you to do you want to come up and join us? Yes. Um, so Aaron is um, one of the founders of uh, Action. Do you want to sit there? Uh, of against child trafficking. Um, Aaron, have you seen this film before? Um, and is this? Can you just tell us your response to the film, please? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I, I, I saw this. Just is that okay? No, it's no, up, just put, put it closer to your mouth. Yeah, no, I have. Uh, I saw the film last last year, December, I think. After after it was premiered, mm -hmm. and yeah, I was shocked. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. I worked before in Ethiopia with on these adoption cases, so I so I knew I could do something, and then it took a while till, uh, till I just started tr uh, working on this case. And um, so, tell us what your organization does and why you founded it. Um, we are registered in the Netherlands. We are a small NGO. Um, we work against child trafficking and pro children's rights, and um, we have a research like twenty. 20 adoption cases uh, in the Netherlands, in the field, and I've actually come to the conclusion what the film shows, but I haven't seen it. I mean, it is, I've heard the stories from the parents in Ethiopia, and they're all the same, they're all similar stories, but I didn't see it before like, like it's shown in the movie, in, uh, in the documentary. Because th there will be some people watching this thinking that <laughs> this is one you know, a very uh, tragic yes. uh, but rare story. Is that your experience? No, it's not rare. It's a very regular story. I, so I met so many parents in Ethiopia whose children yeah, were recruited for adoption in the same manner as we saw in the film. Uh, we worked on a Dutch case, similar story. The parents also had uh, HIV. And in the Dutch case, we were able also to undo the adoption in Ethiopia. Um, so that's that I knew. So that's that's how we started now working on this this case. Um, and while I was driving on to the way to Sinke National Hussein, I had also the address of another mother who lost her two children in a similar manner. So we met that mother and we took her case up. But this this case, as such, was much easier because the child is living now. Um, in a very good foster family, and the foster family was very cooperative. So last week I was in Denmark, last week, eh? last week I was in Denmark with a mother, and we brought the mother, the Ethiopian mother actually, to Denmark to visit her child. So mm, you can find these things on our website, and also at least one picture <laughs> of the reunion. And we, we have given this mother and also Sinkinesh Hussein now legal aid in Ethiopia to undo to revoke the adoption. Um, uh, I've become their legal representative in Denmark, and I try very hard to reconnect them to Masho, but it is, it is really an uphill battle, and we need your support. We need, very, yeah, we need much more support than we have right now, and we have a little bit now. Uh, OK, so I think um, at this point I'm going to open the questions up to the floor. If you could wait <laughs> until the microphone reaches you. Um, so if I could just have someone to help with the microphone. Bringing, please. Thank you very much. Um, if you could keep your questions um, fairly brief, please, so we can get in as many as possible, that would be great. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, I'm a psychotherapist. I work with uh, broken sibling relationships in in adult life. It seems to me that much of what was disturbing Marsha was not not just not just that huge displacement, but but the separation from her her older siblings. And I wondered how those three siblings who had remained in Ethiopia. Had coped with that that breach as well. Um, they are actually coping. They are coping quite well. They they are. Um, they think. Uh, they think she's the lucky one, because she got out to the west. So they they've idealised it as well. What? They've idealised it yes, as well. Yes. Yes. That's part of the problem. That yeah. they think that. Uh, and I, the big brother, the oldest brother, he says that I would go anytime. I mean, um, but and they think even an institution in Denmark is much better than than staying in Ethiopia. So, so they are actually not as broken as her. Okay. Can you talk a little bit more about Masha and what her problems were? I found it hard to 
figure out why exactly they were struggling so much because I didn't see her behaviour kind of as being so difficult. Um, if it's uh, hard to uh, because I'm not a psychotherapist or psychologist. I'm just a documentarist, and what I saw in this uh, home is is what I've shown. I mean, if I had scenes where she was uh, uh, reacting uh, very outspoken or smashing things, I would have put them in. Or um, um, I'm sure uh, she was. I think she was a difficult child. I mean, this uh, I have five myself, and some of them are more uh, difficult than others. And she wasn't. She wasn't very uh, contactful. She wasn't so easy to get in contact with as Roba uh, from the beginning. That's how I experienced her. And from the beginning, I also had to even in the village. I mean, I sometimes had to speak very loudly to her to get her, you know, to say stop. You know, she was like. Uh, but I don't think she was, she was anything. But uh, that was her, her way. I mean, that's also why I put in the scenes where the, the biological parents talk about her because she was a, a, a an outspoken child and she has a temper. And she was, I mean, but that doesn't make her wrong. Or, uh, I mean, f for me, the shocking thing is actually that. Um, I've ever that her reaction seems the most logical reaction. Yeah. You know, exactly. the reaction to what's happened to her seems the exactly. most logical reaction to everything that's gone on. But that's exactly the. Is she sick or is she behaving very healthy to a sick situation? I mean, it's kind of the <laughs> the the, the, uh, the question and. And I never, I mean, <coughs> I, I mean, I had to research backwards because I experienced things, and then I had to go back and say this. Is this just one single, mm. one standalone case? Mm. And I found out that this was very similar. And there's so many cases has popped up, and so many adult adoptees has contacted me. And this behavior is, is, um, I mean, they they recognize so much that pressure they're under to attach to these uh, parents and how they're kind of, you know, you have to love me, mm. and the kind of jealousy that. It works. I mean, the, you, as you see, the adoptive mother, she starts to react almost like a very jealous wife, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, smell the clothes. And, and uh, because she has this huge urge of this child to love her. Mm -hmm. uh. And again, as, I mean, as, as someone who was an orphan, <coughs> who has gone back and met, I, you know, I've met, gone back and met my uh, birth father, and I know, and I know there are some people in the room who have also been described as orphans and then gone back and met their family, uh, their birth families. Aaron, um, this whole idea that, uh, that adoptees are um, inherently, there's something wrong with them, um, th this idea that you're, you're, re re you're reacting to, uh, that what's the normal reaction is seen as something extraordinary. Uh, is this something that, you're, uh, that you encounter in your work? Yeah, <coughs> I mean, specifically the first Ethiopian case we took actually up in, in 2006. <laughs> And it was a very similar case. And then we had this case in the Netherlands, also very similar. And it's just a very healthy reaction of children. And I mean, I have two children. If they suddenly would be in another family, it wouldn't behave uh, strange, then I think that something would be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So, uh, question at the back. Um, following up from what you guys are discussing, Aaron, you're working on a case right now, Masha's case, correct? Yes. Um, I wanted to find out if you've been able to assess what she wants to do, like where she would like to go, how she would like to be placed, because there's a lot of people around making decisions or wanting yeah. decisions, but what, okay, yeah. what does she want? What's yeah. her story? I don't believe anything, because she is with the authorities, and we're dealing here with um, child trafficking, in my opinion, yeah. and because like 15,000 euros something plus minus has exchanged hands in mm -hmm. this process. Um, it is also that the parents in Ethiopia, under the concept of adoption in Ethiopia, is completely different than in Denmark. They are readopted in Denmark. So there, there is a whole, I mean, it's from, from, from Ethiopia up to the highest authorities in Denmark who condone that crime, that was one of the, and, and who are involved. Mm -hmm. So this should not be exposed too much. So Marshall is now in care in a therapeutic home. She is um, voluntarily placed, 
she is the adoptive parents are involved in the process with her and the, and the home has to kind of do everything together with the adoptive parents on 22nd of October I received a letter addressed to the parents I'm the representative of the parents and I forwarded it also like saying that Marshu doesn't want to have contact she's doing very fine she's doing horse riding which means therapy um, she, and she doesn't she, and she doesn't want to have contact also Sink and National Hussein have written a very, very, very nice letter to uh, Marshall with photographs. The letter says, the social worker says, kind of, the photographs have been shown to Marshall, but Marshall didn't even want to read the letter. The authorities wanted to, I mean, in the, in the letter, Sink and National Hussein apologized, really nicely apologized, they say, really, we made a mistake. The social workers, when we had meetings with the social with the social workers, they didn't even want to read out that part to Marshall. Oh. Yeah, so I don't believe anything. I have asked to get reports, to get the medical reports, mm -hmm. denied, legally denied. I don't believe anything in this <laughs> unless I see Marshall myself. The social minister called the whole parliament in Denmark uh, after the, the premiere of the movie. And uh, then they made a, a investigation, their own investigation in Ethiopia, and then they shut down the spe spe uh, specific uh, agency for a while. And now they opened up again after the media attention kind of... Uh, they opened up again and they did some small changes, but they didn't do... But the, the, their own investigation said that this is really, really wrong. It's ethically. Uh, not right what is going on, but the adoption agency is still opening and running, and uh, Arun probably knows more about the political aftermath, <laughs> so uh, uh, he can... Uh, well, and then, and then, I mean, during, while they were making the investigation in Denmark, I was in Ethiopia and meeting Sinke National Hussein, and in the same village, many more parents. So I thought I'm going to mess up their investigation and bring four mothers to the embassy. So we did that, but that even didn't help. So the, office, the report says it's some ethical problems, but the report from the Danish government does not state that there was anything really wrong. They state that the adoption was totally legal. I contest that, but it is very, very difficult to fight, and there is hardly any way for, criminal, for a criminal investigation, because yeah, we also, don't, we also only have yet, yet part of the papers. It's very difficult to reconstruct what actually, actually happened. And um, to get, you know, the, the crime happened in Ethiopia, and to get a criminal investigation going in Ethiopia, very difficult. We, we tried this in the Dutch case, and we fought, the pr prosecutor in the, in the Dutch case fought the case up to the Supreme Court in Ethiopia, and, and I mean, we lost it. <laughs> so I'm not going to try this in this case, because it was... Uh, and it is something, of course, um, the UN Convention on the Right of the Child is completely <coughs> violated. I mean, the child can only, I mean, intercountry adoption is only an option, if at all, if it's really, truly a last option, if the child cannot be cared for in any other suitable manner in the country, <coughs> and the child could have been easily cared for by their parents himself. Uh, yes. Um, hi. Um, I'm a social worker and a trainer <coughs> consultant with the British Association for Adoption and Fostering, and it strikes me that what happened here was there was a little girl who was developing to all intents and purposes quite normally quite well 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 attached and what happened to her subsequently destroyed her psychologically and emotionally she has then been pathologized <laughs> and been told she cannot she clearly she can attach mm. she attached to her birth family she has no problems with attaching not once through, through the entire film was the issue of bereavement and grief and loss mentioned for either of these children. And that wasn't addressed on any level. And it's hardly surprising that she had the, uh, the rage and the grief and the sense of disbelief that wasn't addressed and still hasn't been addressed. And with her brother as well, and to all intents and purposes, not to be disrespectful, but to say, well, he seems to have attached well and he's developing. No, he's gone compliant, he's gone quiet, exactly. and he hasn't done anything. Exactly. He will be reacting. 
just because we can't see it doesn't mean yes. it's not yeah, happening. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But that's, uh, I mean, that that's exact. That's uh, the. I think the key scene in the movie for me is actually the uh, scene where the synchronous and Hussein they um, s are sending off their remaining children to school that morning because that's just a normal family life, you know, and that's what everybody in Denmark are uh, <coughs> demonizing, you know, what she came from, that she came from the dark Africa, and she's probably been, that all her demons come from down there, and, and uh, that's where she's been destroyed. Oh, and I mean, that's kind of the alternative to her life in Denmark. That's, uh, and, and I mean, I don't think anybody is in doubt if they had to choose which kind of life they would, would like to, <laughs> to grow up in, and, and nobody, uh, Recognize that that she l that that what she's lost uh, both her and and Olga, of course. Uh, so we'll go with one here and then another. <laughs> Thanks very much for the film. Um, you talked about in Denmark not intervening in that situation, but I was wondering about Ethiopia as well. When the biological parents are going from door to door trying to find information, they must have turned to you for some of those answers. And how did you explain your methodology to them? But I, I all the time had to balance the loyalty between the Danish parents uh, and the adoptive parents because both of them kind of let me into the process. So the adopt the biological parents they they want they wanted me to tell everything to the Danish parents and the Danish parents they didn't want that sort of contact. So when I went down there, I asked them because I knew the. Qu I mean, of course, I was questioning. I had like a pile of of letters at home uh, about uh, questions of. So I went to the uh, adoptive mother and asked her, said, I'm going there, they're going to ask me, I can. I think you, you should be the one who tells them what has happened. And then she wrote them a letter. But that didn't satisfy them because they knew, they're smart people, they knew that I wasn't, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not coming there anymore. I mean, they wanted the legal, the authorized uh, connection to their children <coughs> that's I mean because I mean I was there yeah they never knew if I, I every time we said goodbye forever I never knew if I came back so of course I provided them uh, with the information I was yeah okay. um, I just want to ask is this agency still operating yes, yes very yeah. much very much okay, that's a shock <laughs> and um, just wanted to just comment on the fact that the parents the adoptive parents from, from Denmark didn't seem even in s to have had any counselling either in terms of preparation. They didn't even <coughs> bother to connect with the biological father to ask about Moshe and her likes, her dislikes. There was absolutely no getting to know her culturally or individually. So it was thought doomed from the beginning on that level. And I just found the Danish adoptive parents to be really irresponsible and also, I'd say, even ignorant. Yeah. They are, they are actually psychotherapists. <laughs> and they are both working in homes for neglected children. Uh, uh, they are, but I mean, it's tragic comic. Uh, but but uh, I I agree. I actually they had the best will. I mean, um, the adoptive mother has a hard personality as a character in a film. But she actually had the best will, and I think if she had gotten better counselling, she could have done much better than than she's actually doing. Um, yeah. uh, Aaron, this idea, because it's often said, you know, well, but the, you know, the adoptive parents are well-meaning, well-intentioned. Um, is that enough? It, it is. It is not enough, um, and I slightly disagree because the idea how the, how is it sold, and you said it in the beginning is. Uh, this is going to be your own child, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still myself, I'm myself adopted, I'm still looking for bleaching powder, I'm still brown. <laughs> 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 I didn't become German, yeah? <laughs> so, I, I mean, that's how I started my work, um, by trying to find my own mother, and um, I have an Indian mother, and I was raised by a white mother. Very well, I had very good adoptive parents, but you, they never, you know, they, adoption is sold as an idea w to have your own child, and it's really own, you, they own it. And um, I mean, I'm trying. I'm I'm trying now for Sinkin Nation Hussein to get in touch with Marshall. The adoptive parents could also allow it. I mean, running into a wall. 
I mean, I, you no, know, the parents try to get in touch with the child and they cannot see their own child anymore. And I had the same scene last week um, because the, the mother, we, which we brought from Ethiopia to Denmark, she has also give, given two children, or two of her children were sent to Denmark, and the little child is still in the family. And she was not allowed to see her own baby. And she was not allowed to see the child. How can that be? Um, just a quick thing. I mean, um, obviously the film is set in Ethiopia, yeah. and um, uh, I think Ethiopia uh, adopts um, or gives up uh, approximately 5,000 children per year, um, and in the last five years has given up 26,000 children, which is more than uh, the rest of the African continent put together. Um, but this isn't just an Ethiopian problem. <laughs> no, it's, it's, a, it's a circus, it's a moving circus. I mean, it, it started, I mean, it's, it's a long history from the Second World War, or even First World War, where we have inter-country adoption, but then you have it from Korea, then, you know, Vietnam War, baby lift, and uh, then Latin America. It's an, it's an ongoing issue. And even Germany, uh, we have been sending children out uh, to the United States as well, but we have, you know, in the good old European countries, we have implemented children's rights, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, and we do no longer export our children. But this is about to change again. <laughs> I mean, there's a huge lobby behind it. And, I mean, who's interested can have a look on our website. We, we have some cases, we have also some studies and some things about that. Right. Okay, I think we can probably take two more. So we're going to take one there. Um, yeah, could you just tell us what your organization is called? I'll say it again. Yeah, um, our organization is called Against Child Trafficking. And that is, if you put it in Google, it comes up immediately. Okay. So we're going to do uh, one here. Um, and then just a very quick question to you as a filmmaker. Um, what do you think the presence of the camera does in this film? Oh, that's uh, very uh, hard to answer. Um, but kind of speculatively, you must have thought about, you know, I mean, would the scenario change in any ways? Or does do things happen outside the camera, which is not in the film? You know, a lot of the in inter uh, kind of interesting stuff happened outside the camera space as well. I film where I include myself um, mm -hmm. as a character. Mm -hmm. uh, but I felt like in the editing room that it would, it, it I saw it more like it would be like a defense for myself, uh, for my own role in this. And I thought that was not interesting to the whole thing. <laughs> and I, I wanted to create a film with the most uh, emotional impact, which I experienced myself because I was like, do I want to see a film where there's a, a well-meaning filmmaker who tries to solve the problem? <laughs> or do I want to end it like where the reality would have ended if I wasn't there and get people out of the seat to say, we must do something about this. And I thought, yes. I want to do the last thing. Uh, just kind of quick thing, because as an audience, we are very aware of the camera's presence. Mm. Because there are various mm. moments you would think, oh my gosh, how is this being filmed? Yeah. And this is not an, you know, kind of a critique completely about the film, but one is thinking, oh my gosh, how would it be different otherwise as well? Yeah, I don't know, but they were, as a, they, they were really, um, they were, they really didn't care about the camera, uh, neither of them, especially the Danish parents, actually so much that sometimes you wanted to say, <laughs> you, know, <I'm> <laughs> you, you are aware that I'm present, right? Because please protect yourself just a little, uh, just a little bit. And actually we, we did protect the, uh, some of the editors who saw some of the first, the first cut, they thought that I was too nice to the uh, adoptive parents, uh, but, uh, um, that yeah, I I don't I didn't want to demonize the more than, um, than necessarily. So uh, I I did actually I didn't uh, feel of course that's also the scene where we included this in front of the then adopt agency because of course the the camera there is kind of a red flag to the agency as well mm -hmm. and and so we are, so that's why we had to kind of put in our own presence in, in the movie to say that we are also part of the, uh, yeah, adding uh, wheat to the conflict or whatever, mm -hmm. so, yeah. Okay, uh, over here. I was six weeks old. So, you know, that <laughs> it's not so easy to say with the attachment thing. So the, 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 the uh, I have seen cases where children uh, were adopted at a very young age and gone completely wrong, and I have also seen cases of children, you know, adopted at the age of eight, nine, ten, and that 
doing quite okay, but everybody has the same patterns of issues, of identity, of roots, of uh, where do I belong to, uh, why am I suddenly in a white family being brown <laughs> or black, all these things, and, and they come up and pop up in different, with different people at, at different ages. <coughs> some must, must uh, become 50 or 40, 30, some start searching at 10. Okay, so um, I'm afraid we're going to have to draw it to a close there. Um, but please, uh, thank you very much for staying. Uh, thank you for a great discussion. And please stay